Okay, for, for everybody's knowledge, thank you for joining us for the, the NESDIS User Engagement Community Speaker Series. Um, this is a way we can try to connect across NESDIS um, and introduce you to some of our end users, the people, the stakeholders that, that are using NOAA data and how is it used and, um, and how we can, you know, continue this communication loop of, you know, connecting with our users and, and asking what are the gaps, what are the needs, um, and trying to improve our products and services. Um, so today uh, we have uh, Randy Bass from the Federal Aviation Administration. Hold on, let me flip to the next screen. Um, let's see, Vanessa, are you? Absolutely, and if there's any trouble hearing me, please go ahead and take over. I apologize, things are out of my hands at the moment. Sure. Um, but Randy, thank you very much. Randy Bass, um, he is one of our NOAA Pathfinders. Uh, NOAA Pathfinders having started just recently at NOAA, supporting our NOAA mission, and really being able to connect society to the use of products is what one of the goals of the Pathfinder is intended to reach. Um, Randy Bass comes to us from the FAA. He has over 30 years of weather experience. Um, he spans military, private, and commercial industry, so his feedback has been absolutely fantastic in our Pathfinder initiative. Uh, Randy's been with FAA since 2012, and he manages the weather research branch within FAA's aviation weather division. Randy's worked very closely with GeoExo. We've developed some value chains for aviation safety. He'll not only talk about those here, but we'll be able to talk about those at next week's AMS out in Madison. Um, Randy does lead the aviation weather research program and the technology in the cockpit program. So he oversees budget, he determines programs of record, and he's executing transition of successful ventures from research to operations. Um, we are very happy to have Randy here with us, uh, a former veteran from the Air Force. Randy, thank you so much for taking the time to give us a talk, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right. Well, thank you, Vanessa. Um, yes, yeah, good to be here. Um, thank you for the invite. Um, so I'm going to basically go over um, mostly kind of what we do in, uh, in weather research in the, on the FAA side. Um, and how we are incorporating satellite data into uh, both our research and, uh, and, and into operations. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit at the end about uh, uh, what our future needs are and, and where we uh, I think the GOXO can, uh, can really help us with, uh, with that. But yeah, a little bit more about me. Um, I've been a uh, meteorologist since 1989, basically, when I joined the Air Force. Uh, retired from the Air Force in uh, 2008 and actually went to uh, work for a defense contractor for about three and a half years. Um, um, I, I won't say which one, but I will say that uh, um, they, they are part of the contract for the uh, GOXO um, parts. So uh, I, I'll just leave it at that. So, um, if you're ready. Um, looks like it's loading up. Great. Um, so again, uh, happy to be here. And uh, go ahead to the next slide. And I will be presenting something similar to this on uh, on Monday during the uh, um, during the panel session um, to lead up to uh, you know questions and things that, that folks may have. So first of all, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on the aviation weather division. Um, basically, we manage the, uh, the weather research portfolio towards new concepts and capabilities. And what we're doing is trying to reduce the impact of weather on the uh, national airspace system. Um, we both try to mitigate those impacts and try to forecast them better. Uh, we are also the U.S. Met Authority on, uh, on aviation weather um, throughout the uh, international uh, arena. So, well, the Weather Service does, uh, does most weather for the, for the nation and, and uh, represents us uh, throughout the world. Um, we are the uh, U.S. Met Authority when it comes to aviation weather. Um, 
And again, we uh, assure the development and integration of uh, uh, weather information into our air traffic management uh, decisions by pilots, controllers, uh, flight operators, even airport operators. And we're trying to do that not only with better quality weather information, but better access to that information and uh, better ways to use that information. You know, it doesn't do us any good if we provide a, a perfect forecast, but the end user doesn't know how to use it. Um, so we're, uh, we're, we're even in the education business and, and uh, trying to uh, uh, get them to understand, you know, how weather fits into their, uh, their operations and their decision making. So next slide. Underneath the Aviation Weather Division is the, uh, and, and underneath my uh, uh, weather research branch is the Aviation Weather Research Program. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about uh, here today. Um, we conduct research to assure the development and integration of weather information into those decisions to support aviation weather initiatives. Um, again, it's, it's mostly applied research. Um, probably 98% of our, our research is applied research. Um, we work very closely with the National Weather Service. In fact, uh, uh, basically every uh, successful capability that, uh, that we're able to uh, research and produce uh, goes into operations or is transferred to the National Weather Service for, uh, to go into operations there. Um, so we work very closely with, uh, obviously, the Aviation Weather Center, but also uh, um, uh, NSEP and EMC and, and NCO and those folks. And, and then we're trying to, uh, again, help mitigate uh, safety and efficiency issues associated with uh, well-documented weather programs. So next slide. I always like this, uh, this depiction um, because it really shows, uh, at, at least uh, uh, from a satellite perspective, what, you know, impacts or the uh, a typical flight. From free, from, yeah, excuse me, from pre-flight to takeoff and departure, en route to arrival and landing and even post-flight. You can see things like uh, now casting, convective initiation, um, uh, cloud classification, lightning, uh, cloud and moisture imagery, uh, ceilings and visibility, uh, turbulence, volcanic ash, icing, uh, winds. Um, all that comes into play when you're, when you're flying. Um, at least in, in some capacity. You know, obviously, uh, volcanic ash isn't always an issue, um, but it is frequently an issue, especially for our uh, 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 Trans-Pacific flights and, and those over Alaska. So we are always uh, looking at ways to exploit um, uh, different types of satellite data. Uh, so next slide. So I've got a couple of slides here on the uh, on how we use convection. Um, yes, and I see the uh, the question about radiation exposure. Um, I will I will I'll, I have a couple of slides at the end that talk or near the end that talk of exactly that. So uh, um, yeah, I, you're you're already you're already ahead of me, but uh, I will be talking about those kind of things. Uh, starting with convection. Um, we've developed a capability called the Offshore Precipitation Capability, OPC, which is not to be confused with the Ocean Prediction Center. Um, and this came about uh, almost 10 years ago now, um, where the uh, uh, flight center down in Miami uh, submitted a, a, what they call a safety report, basically saying um, we control all the Caribbean uh, air traffic, but yet we don't have any good radar coverage down there. Um, all we've got are, are rudimentary satellite products, and we don't even understand how to how to read those. So, uh, working with our uh, uh, laboratory partners, in this case, it was uh, MIT Lincoln Lab. Uh, we came up with a uh, a prototype that takes uh, uh, lightning data, uh, any existing weather radar, uh, satellite imagery, and uh, and uh, the numerical uh, weather model data, and puts that through a uh, convolutional uh, neural network, and comes up with a radar-like depiction of precipitation outside of the uh, normal radar area. So you can see here on the left, 
the uh, what, what you would normally see on radar overlaid on a, a satellite uh, image. And then if you click that one more time, Oops, go back one. Yeah, there, okay, there it is. Um, and you can see that the, uh, um, the capability actually fills in that, uh, that area with uh, uh, what looks like radar data. And so this has been a big hit with the uh, uh, air traffic controllers that uh, man manage those oceanic routes. And we are currently working to get that actually on the, uh, on the glass. Um, for the uh, for the controllers right now, it's just on a monitor in their uh, in their uh, uh, room, so they kind of have to look up and then look down and superimpose it in their minds. But uh, the plan is to get that on the uh, on the scopes uh, by uh, 2026 or so. So next slide. This is our current uh, um, uh, domain area. And you can see it, it basically extends from uh, the middle of the Atlantic, uh, uh, just west of uh, Hawaii, and uh, and you can see that you know this is just a snapshot from about a year ago of how that uh, how that image looks. Uh, next slide. Another one we're doing is called a Romeo Remote Oceanic Meteorological Information Operational. Not not the greatest title, but the uh, acronym is uh, is is great. Um, it was an operational demonstration we did uh, back starting around 2018. We just uh, completed it uh, to evaluate the feasibility of really uplinking weather information to the aircraft over uh, oceanic and uh, remote regions. Um, you probably you. you some people may not realize, but uh, um, aircraft, even commercial aircraft, are really bandwidth restricted. Um, and yes, Dan, the uh, um, the radar reflectivities that are shown on uh, on OPC um, are in the six bands, basically uh, six different bands of uh, of uh, uh, colorization. So. Uh, Levels one and two is, is basically green, which uh, is, is mostly rain. Uh, levels three, four, five, and six all depict various uh, uh, increase in intensities of uh, uh, convection. Um, <laughs> no problem. So uh, for, for Romeo, um, like I said, uh, a, a lot of aircraft, even commercial aircraft, are kind of bandwidth restricted. So to get to send up a radar picture or a satellite picture um, it is basically a no go, but we've been able to take uh, polygons of areas of convection and send that up, and that allows the air crews to see uh, potential areas of convection well ahead ahead of where their uh, onboard weather radar can see which is usually only about 60 miles out ahead of them. So now they can get, uh, you know, areas, and this is near real time. It updates every uh, uh, 10 to 15 minutes. I actually think it's 10 minutes now uh, based on the uh, output from the uh, satellites. Uh, sends that, we process that, send it up to them. Now they can determine, you know, we've got uh, convection uh, 400 miles ahead. Um, we can, we can uh, decide whether we're going to fly through it, fly around it, and if we are going to fly around it, now we've got a good idea to go, uh, you know, right 10 degrees around it as opposed to going left 10 degrees and running into more convection and, and then doing even more uh, uh, diversions. So this has uh, worked out very well. It, it's similar to OPC in that it merges weather satellite data, lightning data, and forecast model data to uh, determine that activity. Um, the big difference on this is one, it's worldwide. Um, although I guess that should be somewhat restrictive. It's actually uh, within the areas of uh, uh, goes east, goes west, and Himawari. Um, it doesn't incorporate the uh, GLM data from goes and uh, uh, lightning detection data from uh, some of the ground network uh, um, vendors. Um, we have uh, just last month um, actually met. Uh, actually, it wasn't last month. It was back in May. Um, actually, met with uh, some of the commercial weather providers and the airlines to uh, uh, transfer this to a uh, um, in, into a commercial operations. So, uh, next slide. 
And this just uh, gives you a kind of a depiction of what the, uh, the cloud top heights on the left and uh, uh, the CDO, which is uh, uh, cloud deterministic oceanic something. I can't remember what the ac actual acronym is, but CDO is the, the aerial the, um, uh, geographical area of the, of the uh, convection, and CTH is obviously cl the cloud tops. Uh, next slide. We are actively working to incorporate uh, satellite imagery into our uh, current icing product, which is the analysis of icing, um, available uh, through the uh, Aviation Weather Center uh, website. Um, in the past, we have just relied on temperature and uh, dew point or humidity to uh, uh, forecast icing conditions. Um, but as you know, that's uh, uh, it, it's empirical, but it, it's it usually uh, uh, well, uh, well over forecast uh, icing conditions. Now we're looking at things like uh, uh, incorporating radar data as well as satellite data um, in, into that analysis product to uh, uh, really do, uh, refine the uh, the areas and use uh, supercooled large drops as the uh, uh, delineation as opposed to just temperature and dew point. Uh, next slide. Uh, similar for turbulence, um, satellite data is used independently by uh, aviation meteorologists to uh, detect areas of potential turbulence. And um, I think we've, folks who have used uh, uh, satellite data in the past, you can see the little uh, bands of, of clouds and, and know that that's a good uh, uh, indicator of, of potential turbulence. Um, so, so that's one way we do it. And then if you go to the next slide. We're also integrating satellite imagery and, again, GLM uh, data into our, uh, uh, specifically, our Graphical Turbulence Guidance Nowcast product. Uh, this is a zero-hour analysis um, that then provides a 15-minute forecast out to one hour, um, and it's updated uh, uh, every 15 minutes. And then we have the regular Graphical Turbulence Guidance product that's uh, uh, a forecast out to 18 hours. The, uh, as you can see, when we incorporated uh, uh, lightning data, um, GLM data into uh, uh, GTGN, we had a huge effect on the, uh, on, on the locations of the uh, uh, potential areas of turbulence. And you can see that on the left where the little circle is. It's uh, uh, showing maybe some very light uh, turbulence. Um, whereas when you incorporate the GLM data, you can see that it's uh, you know a much much uh, stronger return on the uh, on the analysis for uh, you know, uh, moderate moderate to uh, potentially severe icing or uh, turbulence. Sorry about that. Um, so uh, next slide. Started to do a lot of work with uh, satellite data with our cloud ceiling and visibility uh, program. Uh, one of the cases is, uh, uh, you're probably familiar with the LAMP um, product. It uh, produces objective guidance on a, on a statistical interpretation of, of observations and model output. Um, but it's very sparse in some areas of the country, especially the Intermountain West, where you don't see a lot of uh, ob observations. You can see that uh, in this uh, upper right uh, panel. Uh, if you look at... Uh, say Montana, um, and even uh, uh, Oregon and Nevada, for example, you don't see a lot of, uh, a, a lot of observation areas or, or uh, stations there. So to fill that in, we're incorporating uh, satellite data to improve the uh, uh, visibility or the, uh, and David Helms is correct, the uh, LAMP is largely dependent on the, uh, the ASOS for the ground truth. So what we're trying to do is fill in those areas where we don't have an ASOS um, using the satellite data, both uh, you know, the fog probabilities and, and, uh, um, and other uh, methods to, uh, uh, to fill that in and, and produce some uh, good uh, uh, cloud bases, cloud heights, and, and even some uh, uh, to help with the visibility. So if you go to the next slide, 
some of the products that uh, um, that we're looking at or, or use include uh, uh, cloud top heights, uh, pressures, um, black body temperatures, uh, liquid water content, cloud phase. Um, what we're really looking at for this is a cloud mask um, because that uh, that helps us determine where there are areas that we still need to, to figure out ways to uh, uh, fill in those uh, those gridded areas where we don't have good observations. Um, but it's uh, uh, it's really been a helpful in, uh, in some of our initial res research there. We're also looking at using the uh, uh, GOES fog and low stratus um, uh, capability to uh, uh, come up with the probability of marginal VFR conditions, um, the probability of IFR and below, um, and fog depth. We have tested this um, a lot in the San Francisco area. Um, San Francisco Airport, the, they have a dual runways that are, that are parallel, but they're actually uh, too close together that when you have uh, uh, anything below uh, VFR conditions, um, the arrival rate has to be reduced because if the planes can't see each other, they, they have to be uh, spaced farther apart. Um, and anybody who knows about San Francisco knows that they have a huge fog and stratus problem, uh, especially during the uh, spring and, and summer months. So we are looking at using uh, the GOES data to, to help uh, not only see it when it occurs, but also to forecast the dissipation of it. And we've had some good success um, in the last couple of years doing that. Um, so. Uh, uh, we will continue to work that. Um, and the last bullet, um, you know, some of our techniques at times produce some false clouds, um, especially during the uh, um, transition period between day and night. Um, so those are some of the things that uh, uh, we struggle with, but, um, you know, I, I think a lot of other folks struggle with that, uh, that issue as well. So it's, it's nothing unique to us. Um, next slide. Um, so there was a, a couple of comments earlier about uh, space weather impacts to aviation. Um, obviously, uh, HF uh, radio degradation and loss um, using the day-night band for fog detection. Uh, for, honestly, I couldn't tell you that. That's a good question. I can, I can go back and an, um, find that answer out. I'll talk to my uh, uh, CNV uh, research lead and find that out. That's a good question. So uh, uh, obviously space weather affects um, HF radio degradation, uh, GPS, uh, and uh, precision location errors, and that increased radiation dose exposure to uh, um, air crews and passengers. Um, in the past, I, I wouldn't say that we have ignored this issue. It's just that um, whenever we have brought it up to the airlines, they kind of pushed us away and said, um, we don't want to know, so leave us alone. Um, but uh, it, it has come uh, kind of to the forefront in the last few years. Um, and, and I would say that part of that is probably the pilots union and the, the flight attendants union um, has has started to, uh, to bring that up in their uh, um, in some of their questions to the airlines, and so the, now the airlines have come to us. So we actually hired a space weather uh, um, a subject matter expert a few years ago to build up a uh, space weather research program for aviation. Um, so uh, uh, again, this is this is becoming more of an issue for us, and and we're going to. Uh, uh, starting to tackle it head on. So now next slide. Uh, I see a question about uh, uh, what sources does the FAA get our information from. Um, Space Weather Prediction Center um, is, is where we get everything from, just like uh, everybody else. Um, we do have a, uh, a radiation model. Um, that uh, that is run out in Oklahoma City at the uh, uh, our tech center out there. Um, 
I wouldn't say it's real time. It's, it's near real time, but there's actually some issues that um, if we were to issue anything from that, it could be in conflict with the the uh, with SWIPC. So we're kind of working the details on exactly how that's uh, um, that's going to work or or how we're going to do that in the future. And that's that's one of the uh, uh, the problems that our uh, our research lead is going to take on um, because I I think she's going to end up being the the space weather lead for the FAA, not just for our, our branch. Um, so again, we're utilizing the, uh, uh, the, the GOES-R series for uh, space weather monitoring. It, you're correct. We don't, we don't use experimental data in operations, um, but, uh, and, and this one, I wouldn't say it's, op I wouldn't say it's experimental, but I wouldn't call it operational either. So um, it's, uh, again, one of those things that we kind of struggle with. Um, and then you know, besides just aviation, the FAA is, is getting a lot more involved as, um, on the uh, commercial space aspect, and um, we're actually providing oversight of that. And so I think we're going to get involved with uh, eventually with the satellite uh, exposure and, and uh, issues with uh, space weather as well. But I think that's a little farther down the road, but, but something I think we're going to have to take into account. Uh, next slide. And I already mentioned volcanic ash. Uh, our group does not specifically do anything um, uh, besides uh, keep up with, with some of the research going on with volcanic ash. Um, but uh, again, it's still uh, uh, vitally important, or the satellite data is vitally important in identifying those ash plumes. Um, and, and then I just actually just lied. We are actually going to do a project. Um, we are finalizing it right now to do some volcanic ash research here uh, starting in FY23. So, uh, um, so we are getting more involved in, in this as well. Uh, next slide. And I just wanted to show this slide because I, I haven't talked about uh, UAS and uh, um, urban air mobility operations yet. It's uh, still kind of a fledgling area. Um, we're, we're getting really involved in all our other aspects, such as turbulence and icing and uh, ceiling and visibility. Um, but this, one area we haven't done a lot in is at very low levels, you know, zero to uh, or the surface to, uh, you know, maybe 3,000 feet or, or less, uh, which is where most of our uh, 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 UAS and UAM operations are going to be. So uh, we think there's going to be some, some use of satellite data there as well. Um, but you can see just on this slide, it's not just UAS, it's not just commercial flight. Um, we've got uh, general aviation, um, we've got the uh, uh, commercial space, we've got high altitude, long endurance aircraft that uh, are becoming uh, uh, more prevalent. So uh, um, I know the Air Force has their, uh, uh, you know, their mantra is mud, Air Force weather is mud to the sun. Um, ours isn't quite there, but we're probably surface to, uh, uh, surface to space or, or something similar to that. So uh, uh, our, our portfolio will continue to grow. Uh, next slide. So some of our future research uh, plans, we're, uh, um, we have traditionally just looked at, uh, besides lightning data, um, really just uh, uh, satellite imagery. But I think where we're going to start looking at, and I'm really pushing our folks to, to do, is look at uh, the non-imagery weather data. Um, you know, the, the, the CRIS and the OPS and, and some of that, uh, the data on GPSS. I really think there's some uh, uh, capabilities there that, that we can exploit. Uh, both for detection and improved uh, forecast of aviation hazards. Uh, again, that, uh, that uh, multispectral microwave sounding data. Um, you know, I, I, I throw out this question, um, instead of throwing out that uh, data when a cloud is observed, um, why can't we use it to detect clouds? Um, you know, that, that's something we actually need that I, that I think is falling on the floor right now. Um, improving the forecast of convective initiation. Um, and, and this is something I, I don't have on here, but 
we have a requirement uh, for our uh, uh, time-based uh, flow management uh, of, of aircraft of a four-hour forecast of convection with an accuracy of within three nautical miles and 10 minutes of, uh, of occurrence. Um, we can't do that right now, obviously, um, but I think we're getting closer. The models are getting a lot better, um, but I think, uh, you know, the use of a geostationary sounder would significantly improve our, our chances of, of doing that from a convective initiation um, uh, aspect that uh, you know, we can really see those where those conditions are, are ripe uh, to occur out in, uh, in, in that kind of kind of uh, time frame. So I, I think that's where we're really looking at uh, uh, the use of a geostationary sounder, uh, but obviously for turbulence, icing, and, and uh, as well as cloud ceilings and visibility. Uh, and we're using uh, uh, JPSS data or more and more to uh, do some of those proofs of concept. And then we're looking at uh, the use of satellite data for deriving wind speed and direction throughout the atmospheric column, not just near the surface, um, but in route as well. Uh, next slide. Go back one, please. So uh, in, in summary, again, we, uh, we can conduct applied research to uh, minimize the impact of weather on the NAS. Um, we have not had a fatal uh, U.S. commercial airline accident due to weather in, in about 15 years now. Um, but that's no reason to, uh, to, to sit back and say, you know, mission accomplished. Um, uh, obviously, it's, uh, we still have a lot of general aviation accidents uh, that are caused by weather, and weather is actually the leading cause of fatalities in general aviation accidents. So we uh, uh, you know, need, to, uh, need to continue working on that. Uh, we're leading significant... Uh, research to exploit and integrate weather satellite data into our uh, products and capabilities. And, and again, just, uh, you know, foot stomp in that need for that geostationary um, sounder. Um, and with that, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. And uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. And I don't know if I missed any on the, uh, on the chat. Now one one I see from uh, from Mr. Volts on uh, uh, on exposure studies or observations on flights. Um, one of the things we are really going to um, try to do is, uh, for example, getting uh, uh, dosimeters dosimeters on uh, on aircraft, um, preferably commercial aircraft, but most any aircraft, because um, I think that's a. a one area that we're that uh, I wouldn't say we're deficient at because we haven't done it yet, but it's uh, um, we get very little you know space weather type you know radiation data in those uh, uh, in route altitudes. So that's that's one area we would like to uh, to exploit. So I was using the raise hand feature, Allison, but thank you, Randy, for the presentation. This is Steve Bolt. So. Um, lots of great, lots of great information here, and, and a couple of, of questions. Um, by the way, we're data hogs, so if you get dosimeter data, we want it. Well, we wanted our pre found it and when, so we could use it as well for validating our own transmission atmospheric models, et cetera. And and that would be um, the plan is that we would we yeah. would definitely share that data, or or maybe even have you as a repository for it. Um, both open to the discussion on both points. Um, so one question I put to you, uh, I have a bunch, but I hope others have as well. If you were to prioritize, I'm looking just sort of the the driving mentality of your organization. If you were to prioritize your um, your key elements for research or improvement investments, um, how would you characterize it? I was thinking, would it be safety of lives saved, efficiency of the systems operation, de minimizing delays, pollution control, fuel efficiency? What would be what? What is you mentioned safety a couple of times? Is that the the primary metric, or do you have multiple um, that are equally challenging? So the, the FAA states that we are a safety organization first. So yes, I would, I would still say safety, safety would be our primary um, focus. Um, efficiency would be a close second though. And, and actually most of the work that we're doing 
in our uh, aviation weather research program is more geared towards efficiency than uh, safety. Our weather technology in the cockpit program, they're, they're focused more on the general aviation folks, so they are more of a, a safety, you know, they're, they're, their mantra is probably safety. AWRP would be research, I mean, um, uh, efficiency. On that, though, we're, we want to get more involved in the um, reduction of emissions and, and areas like that. Um, and it's, uh, unfortunately, most of the money that the uh, FAA gets, I shouldn't say unfortunately, most of the money that the FAA is getting right now for uh, climate and uh, climate research is geared towards uh, uh, fuels. So we're not, you know, we really don't get uh, to play in that, but, uh, but I'm pushing us to, to do that. And, and any time that we show an efficiency uh, gain, uh, we're also showing, you know, that's a reduction in fuel, which turns into a reduction of uh, a CO2 emissions and things like that. So it is, it, it is a focus, but um, it's probably not a primary focus right now. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, Renata, I think you had a question. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your presentation, by the way. Really helpful um, and interesting. My question was, uh, you had talked a little bit about safety, and then you mentioned um, San Francisco and the fog, but I think there's also a financial component for the aviation industry. Um, what inform, what challenge, if you could solve it, would have the biggest financial impact on the aviation industry in your, in your, from your perspective? Uh, probably reducing delays and cancellations. And most of the delays and cancellations that are occurring right now are still due to convection. Um, so that, that would be the, the biggest way that we would impact uh, um, anything financially, um, especially for the aircraft or for the airlines. But if we can reduce the number of delays, and we actually have. Um, there's a, uh, you, you've probably heard that 70% uh, you know, of all delays uh, by the airlines are caused by weather. That was true in 2006, 2008 timeframe. It's, it's really down to about 55 to 58 percent now, um, which is still high, but it's, uh, it's a lot lower than it used to be. Now, whether that is entirely because you know, our forecasts are better or we're using them better, um, that's very hard to say. We've looked, we've looked into it. Uh, it could also be a, a, a factor of, uh, you know, airline consolidations and, and things like that, that, that may be causing that. Um, but it's still, but it's still a huge, um, a still a huge issue. Um, if we can reduce that even further, it not only helps the airlines, but it helps the air traffic controllers because that's, that's less work on them and less work on them makes the, uh, the whole NAS safer. So it's, it's kind of a, uh, uh, it's almost an R2O, uh, O2R type of thing that if we can help one area, it actually helps another. And then the feedback goes back in and, and further uh, uh, improves things. Thank you. Um, I believe Tyne had a question. Yeah, um, thank you for the information. Um, it's like uh, my question is how do you or do you have a a, a um, system to evaluate what the value or impacts to end users you know like aviation is you know pilot or so how do you know they your your service is doing well yeah yeah that, that, that's a good question and and something I, I didn't mention on here um, so we have actually two groups uh, within our uh, uh, aviation weather division um, one is a quality assessment uh, team and they don't actually do the quality assessments but they manage the team we have a third party um, which is normally uh, the uh, 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 global systems lab folks out in Boulder 
Um, they will do quality assessments on any of our new products and, and capabilities before we even put them out the door to make sure that, uh, you know, whatever product or, or capability it is, that it does what it's supposed to do um, and, and does no harm to the system. You know, if we, if we have a capability that's 90% accurate, um, which sounds great, but the other 10% is catastrophic, to the to the uh, to the NAS, you know, obviously we can't we can't put that out there. So we do a uh, a, a good quality assessment to make sure that uh, you know things are as good as as we think they're supposed to be. The other is the uh, it's called the uh, Aviation Weather Demonstration and Evaluation Team, um, and they're out of the uh, our tech center in Atlantic City. They actually do the user evaluation, so they're going out and talking to uh, air crews and uh, you know, pilots and air traffic controllers and uh, airline uh, dispatchers and others to, uh, to, to make sure that, that those products are indeed uh, you know, what they need and being used in the right way. Um, and, and that includes human factors parts, you know, not, not just the, uh, you know, making sure that those products do what they're in, is supposed to do, but are the colors correct? Um, you know, if, if there is, you know, some kind of setting that you need to make, is that, is that useful or is it easy to find and easy to do? So, yes, we do, uh, we do all of that as well. It, it's funny that uh, each year as we're planning our uh, out-year budget um, uh, request, we, we have a team that comes in and, and uh, reviews all of our uh, uh, different areas, you know, of, of research, you know, turbulence and icing and, and all of those and uh, quality assessment and, and the audit team are included in that. And every year they come in dead last um, in our priorities. And every year we bump them back up and fund them because um, none of our other research is going is any good if we can't do the, uh, the quality assessment and the user evaluations to make sure that they're, that they're done correctly. So, uh, yeah, that's a very important part of, of what we do. Thanks, Randy. Uh, I had a question. You were talking about how you get false positives, like um, with the cloud cover, and I'm just curious the ramifications of that. Does it just diverting planes? Or are there any other more serious results from those false positives? And is that from using NOAA data into the models that are, like you said, like 98%? Yeah, most, most of the false positives that we're seeing are still in our research work, mm -hmm. so it's not going out into operations yet. Okay. Um, so those are, those are the things we're trying to trying to fix before we submit into operations. Or if we did put it in operations, um, we'd probably put a caveat that you know it could only be used um, in in these certain uh, times of day or or areas you know where there's full cloud or full. Uh, uh, daylight or, or nighttime conditions. So, uh, so yeah, so it, it hasn't caused us any problems operationally yet, um, only because we haven't um, uh, transitioned into operations. Sure. Um, Andrea, I see you have a question. Oh, I was just asking based on uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, based on um, when you were talking about the close call, well, talking about the um, the runway at San Francisco Airport and how they're so close together. So I was just wondering if there have been any close calls um, due to any of the planes that were descending into the airport um, due to any fog. None that I'm aware of, um, but that doesn't mean that it hasn't happened. I just, you know, um, you know, that, that, that fog and that airport have been a problem for many, many years. Um, we had some uh, uh, good systems that we had set up with the, uh, uh, that, that National Weather Service actually maintained um, using SODARs and, and, and other things. Unfortunately, those systems um, became uh, worn out over the last three or four years and, and are no longer usable. So we're coming up with some different solutions. Um, and, and satellite data is gonna be a big part of that solution, um, I think, whatever whatever the uh, end result is. Um, 
But yeah, I, I think you know the the, the FAA tends to be a, an extremely cautious organization, um, so they they reduce the re arrival rates probably a little bit lower than you know maybe they could even get away with just to just to keep it safe enough so that there aren't any uh, uh, close calls uh, as far as the uh, the aircraft coming together. Mort, you had a question. Go ahead and unmute. Uh, yes, I think that you uh, covered this uh, a bit uh, before. You said that the budget, um, I don't know if it's your particular branch or let's just call it uh, satellite, uh, satellite uh, weather predictions and use um, are down at the bottom. Um, since it has been, uh, since you do demonstrate how good and how important, um, how important that data is, uh, why does it go down there? I mean, this is kind of a PC. <laughs> you have to have a PC, and but why is it down there at the at the bottom? Um, uh, yeah, simple. Sure, yeah. simple um, so as far when I when I was talking about at the bottom, I was talking about specifically the budgets for our, our or the uh, the priorities for our uh, quality assessment and uh, user evaluation groups. Um, but we uh, we always pump them back up and, and fund them at uh, at basically what they're what they're asking for. Um, as far as our overall budget, um, I will say that in uh, FY twenty one we got cut uh, about fifty four percent from what our uh, budgets had been running before then, um, and some of it was was where I mentioned the. Uh, you know, we were we were a victim of our own success because there had been no commercial um, accidents um, recently. Um, we went back and and um, you know, you know fought internally with our folks, um, with other FAA uh, people, um, and then all the way up to Congress. And we also had uh, groups like uh, National Center for Atmospheric Research uh, went and talked to their congressmen and. Uh, MIT Lincoln Lab uh, folks went and talked to their congressmen, and uh, in FY22 we got our budgets restored back to uh, to what they are, um, to what they had been in the past. Um, but yeah, we we still struggle with funding, just like everybody else. Um, we could uh, we, we can always use more, but on the other hand, um, our 23 and 24 budgets are. Uh, really back to what they were in the 2016-17 time frame. So, uh, um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, we've got a good story to tell and, and we're able to tell that now to the, to the, to the bean counters who really matter. And uh, um, now, you know, we, we certainly don't have a hundred million dollar a year budget. It's nowhere near that, but it's, uh, it's at least uh, uh, at, at the point that we can we can get some uh, quality work done and and uh, and get that uh, data out to the uh, uh, to the uh, operational side and you know I we've done a little bit of back of the hand calculations and I, I'd like to do more um, but I think our return on investment is uh, you know something like twenty to one um, with some of the things that we've done in the past. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Preston, would you like to ask? Well, maybe he dropped off. Um, the question I do, he I, had. I do, I do see that one about uh, yeah. um, convection delays. Mm -hmm. um, Um, <laughs> yeah, that's it's actually a good question. You know, um, you know those those uh, frontal frontal systems and and lines of storms obviously are easy to easier to forecast as they uh, as they come across the country. Um, whereas the the pop up thunderstorms in the in the uh, in summertime afternoons, especially in the south and and uh, maybe even the East Coast are, are much harder to do. 
Um, we still fight with that. I mean, that's the, you know, we, uh, uh, one of the things that we, that our organization did or, or the AWRP did, uh, we funded a lot of the development of the HER. And the HER was the first convection allowing model. Um, and it was specifically for aviation so that we could do a better job of forecasting that. It just turned out that, you know, it was so successful that now the, you know, all the uh, weather forecast offices use, use the HER for, for that and fire weather and everything else. Um, but yeah, we, we still struggle with, with those, uh, those pop-up thunderstorms. Um, and unfortunately, um, that, that's still the big issue because a thunderstorm in, say, South Dakota is not a problem. You know, a line of thunderstorms through Kansas is usually not a problem because we can see them, we can, we can divert around them. That pop-up thunderstorm in eastern Pennsylvania is a huge problem because it gets right in the arrival path of the New York airports. And if you shut down um, or if you get, start getting delays in, the, uh, uh, in New York, those, those delays propagate throughout the entire country. So that, that's our focus is uh, um, we kind of call it the golden triangle between Atlanta, uh, New York, and Chicago. That, that's really our main focus is, is uh, trying to forecast thunderstorms better in those areas because it does have a cascading effect once it starts. Thank you. Is there anyone else that have a question? Um, other than that, I'd like to pass it off to Vanessa. And if you have additional questions, you can put them in the chat or just email Randy. Or, or if you're going to be at the uh, uh, satellite conference on Monday, I'll be there. I'll get there Monday around lunchtime. I'll be there all week. So look me up there. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, it was very interesting, and we've collected, um, you know, a video for for our internal viewers. If there aren't any more questions, I thank you guys for coming to the speaker series. We look forward to seeing you at the next one. Well, thank you very much. I, I uh, like I said, I appreciate uh, being invited to this and. Uh, if anybody has any questions, you, you see my email there. And, and again, I'll uh, uh, be at the uh, uh, conference next week. All right. Looking forward to continuing working with you, Randy. Thanks. Okay. Bye. All right. Take care, everyone.